you're listening to the SSPX podcast, and welcome to episode 10 in our sacrament series, where Father Michael Goldaddy will join us to begin our study of the Sacrament of Confirmation. In this first of two episodes on confirmation, we'll first take a step back and look at the institution of the sacrament, its history, and why it's practiced differently in the Eastern churches versus the Latin church. We'll also look briefly at the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the matter and form of confirmation, and why the church talks about the perfection of Catholic virtues in this sacrament more than the others. Then, in our next episode with Father Goldaddy, we'll compare and contrast the new rite and the traditional rite. As we move forward in this series, we're looking for help. If you like these series and want to have more of them, you can help us by leaving a rating or a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And you can share it with someone who you think would like it, appreciate it, or maybe they just need it. That's the best way to help because you're helping us with this apostolate to reach as many people as possible with the beauty and the truth of what it means to be a traditional Catholic. Now, let's join Father Goldaddy for episode 10 of the sacrament series right now. Welcome back to the SSPX podcast, and we're starting our next section on the sacraments with confirmation with Father Michael Goldaddy. Hello, Father. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to talk about this beautiful sacrament. Absolutely. Confirmation. Thank you for coming. As we're recording this, we are actually just starting Lent. It's actually Ash Wednesday today. Um, anything planned for St. Vincent's for Lent? We were just talking a little bit beforehand about parish missions. Uh, it's a busy time of year regardless. For sure, for sure. Um, well, I was very happy to to see the numbers this morning at the two public masses. We have a third one tonight, so lots of ashes and lots of confessions. Very good. Good way to start. That's great. Uh, great. Yeah, great way to start. Well, Father, let's talk a little bit about confirmation. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be talking about the traditional form, the traditional rite, but also let's start with a little bit of background information about what confirmation is, Father. Yeah, absolutely. And and pardon me if I reserve talk even about the traditional ceremony as such to the second podcast okay. because it helps to do a bit of a contrast between the two. Sure. Um, but I would like to uh, talk about the uh, effects in general of, of confirmation. Uh, we could say that confirmation is a perfection in Christ. Um, you know, Father Wiseman did a great job, as usual, um, talking about uh, the baptism being the incorporation of the soul um, in Christ. And confirmation is uh, still its, its, its own sacrament, right? It's, it's giving something to the soul, which is unique, um, something more than baptism. And that is the you know, maturing of the soul, if you will, the growing up of the soul, the strengthening of, of the soul. And so we, we call it a, a perfection, but a perfection um, in, in Christ. Um, you know, it's remarkable that God has called us to be saints. When we consider what, what we have, that even after baptism, you know, we're still so wounded. Um, uh, God has called us to be saints, to be perfected according to the image of his son. You know, our Lord even says that you, know, you therefore are to be perfect, even as your heavenly father is perfect. So uh, he, through baptism, we're brought into divine life, uh, into the divine family. And uh, to help us grow and to, to be saintly, um, we do need something more. And I think we can use an analogy, and it's it's used by spiritual writers, by theologians, an analogy with the natural life. You know, just as in the natural life we are born, we're not born into full adulthood. We're born as a as a helpless infant, a weak infant. We have to grow into um, uh, adulthood. Um, so also in the spiritual life, right? We're we're born to supernatural life, but now that supernatural life has to grow, has to become stronger. Um, has to be able to handle the challenges of of, of adulthood, and uh, and that's confirmation. Um, and it's clear in Scripture that this is a a separate sacrament from baptism. I think one of the the clearest instances of that is in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter eight. You have Philip who 
incidentally, is not the Apostle Philip. He's the, the, one of the first deacons um, ordained Philip. And he will um, baptize, but then he doesn't confirm. He holds back from confirmation because he doesn't have the, the power to do so. He has to wait for the apostles, Peter and John, uh, to come uh, to lay their hands, which was one of the old expressions for, for confirmation. Um, lay hands upon uh, those that Philip has baptized. Very interesting. Of course, the Holy Ghost, um, who our Lord reserves for this moment, or he sends for this moment of the confirmation of the apostles, um, comes at Pentecost. And I'll maybe circle back a little later to talk about the institution of the sacraments. Um, we're still uh, speaking about the effects, kind of the, if you will, the, the general picture here before you get into the nuts and bolts of the sacrament. Um, but that 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 first Pentecost illustrates, um, of course, what uh, confirmation does. Uh, uh, when you when you consider the remarkable changes, the remarkable effects of that first Pentecost, here you have the apostles who were, you know, ostensibly weak men. Um, you know, Peter, the rock on which uh, our, our Lord is going to build His church. Um, you know, up to the, the, the time of the cross, uh, shows it shows a great weakness. Uh, at the Last Supper, uh, he has received the priesthood, uh, he has received the Eucharist, uh, and yet the the cross still scandalizes him. <laughs> He's still weak in, in the face of the cross, and our Lord has to tell him, get behind me, saying, you're an obstacle uh, to, uh, to, to the redemption. And then, of course, in Gethsemane, the, the apostles will abandon our Lord. Right. Um, and yet, after Pentecost, all thing, uh, all this is different. Right? They're, they're, they're transformed men. You have Peter who boldly preaches to the, the thousands, and he says, neither is there salvation anyone except for our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Um, they will work miracles in Jesus' name. They endure incredible things uh, for the sake of Jesus um, and they're, they rejoice that they're counted worthy to suffer for him, right? And this is the, the coming of the Holy Ghost, right? You know, that, that these men, simple as they were in their understanding, um, that, that they could start a work that would surpass the work, you know, over the hundreds and thousands of years um, uh, of, of any other institution. Uh, uh, of any other geniuses of, of history, this is the mark of, of the Holy Ghost. And, um, of course, we're, we're given that uh, ability, that grace to receive uh, the same sacraments. Um, now, you, you wonder to yourself, well, that didn't happen on my confirmation. Right. Right. <laughs> I didn't start I speaking in to, tongues. Um, yeah, I wasn't able to go out and start converting everyone. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, and there's a few reasons for that. <laughs> uh, you know, first off, uh, the uh, the very remarkable things I, I think of, you know, speaking in tongues, um, prophesying, uh, the, the, the list of the what we call charisms. Um, these are not the gifts of the Holy Ghost. That was something special given to uh, the apostles and, and disciples of the early church. Uh, for the, the, the for God's purposes of the early church to help it spread, um, and these charisms have, for the most part, disappeared um, since then. But the essential effects of confirmation have have not. And um, you know, certainly, the effects of confirmation will be seen in a person according to their disposition at the time of receiving it. I, I think I'm going to come back to this point as well later on. Um, but it's, it's good to make that here. You know, we, we do have our own Pentecost, but it's visibly different, <laughs> even right. though the, the invisible effects are still there. The, 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 the grace, the essential grace of, of, of Pentecost is still there that we receive. Would it be fair to say, Father, that the, the proper, the, the effects of confirmation that we receive are almost in a way hidden 
you don't necessarily see them right away. You more see the results. And and I'm thinking of uh, Father Pagliarani's uh, recent uh, conference that he gave that was translated. It's up on the website now, mm-hmm. where he talked about Archbishop Lefebvre having the gift of counsel. And this right. is one of those gifts of the Holy Ghost where you don't necessarily see, oh, that person has the gift of the Holy Ghost, but through their actions, you can kind of see it. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, the gifts of the Holy Ghost are there and they become active or they're activated by the Holy Ghost as circumstance uh, requires. Um, and it's probably most noticeable in, in those moments where, humanly speaking, um, there is not sufficient preparation for the answer or the action, which is made at a time. Um, you know, something else is pushing other than pure natural intelligence, if you will. Sure. That's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> right. Very interesting. So, um, could we talk then about the gifts of the Holy Ghost a little bit more, Father? Sure. Um, and, and they certainly deserve a lot of attention. Um, it may, maybe they're not given as much attention because uh, typically the, the discussion of these gifts uh, pertains to that part of the of spiritual theology, which is called the, the mystical life, where that action of God, the action of the Holy Ghost, is is predominant. But um, you know, there there is a a gift, if you will, or an action of of the Holy Ghost, uh, which corresponds to each of our uh, capacities, each of our abilities, um, and each one of these Holy Go- uh, gifts of the Holy Ghost will support the work of virtue um, that that is in each one of us. You know, just as we enumerate a a virtue. Uh, for the different, um, um, let's say, um, efforts of of the human being, the different powers of, of the human being. Uh, these gifts of the Holy Ghost are there to support um, the action of the uh, of the virtues, and um, you know, to again to to really illustrate how uh, remarkable these these gifts are to appreciate their their greatness. Uh, again, we're called to be godlike, right? We're, we're called to uh, be as perfect as our heavenly Father as is perfect, and so these these gifts are there to uh, work with a very fallen nature uh, to accomplish uh, this. And again, at the, at the various levels, uh, in, intelligence, passion, um, decision making, uh, there's there's a gift uh, as as we need it. Of course, we. I enumerate seven gifts, and this is based upon Scripture in the book of Isaiah. So there's the enumeration of, of the seven gifts. And theologians have shown a, a correspondence between um, the, the, each gift and the principal virtues of the human soul. You know, the theological virtues, the cardinal virtues, they'll, they'll align one gift um, with each of these virtues. Um, but again, the, the gifts are a, we, we call it a, a divine mode of acting. The, the virtues are a human mode of acting, you know, just as in things human, we will grow through the repetition of an action. We'll get better at it. Um, the, 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 that's, that's the human way of, of, of operating. The gifts will, uh, again, act, act in a divine mode. They're there, they're immediate, um, and as long as the Holy Ghost has uh, that cooperation of, of our nature, it, it, he works. Um, and which, again, is, it comes back to that point, you know, we need to dispose ourselves for the reception, uh, for the action of, of, these, of these gifts. Um, you know, spiritual writers have used the, um, the example of a, of, a, of a boat, and the boat may be, powered by oars, you know, that's sort of the um, example of human labor or the human virtues at work. Or you can put up the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the sails on the mast and catch the wind. And that's a, a good illustration of the gifts of the Holy Ghost. You know, the, uh, the oarsman doesn't have to work or work as hard, at least, because of the action of the gifts. I play piano, so 
you know, if, if, if you have a really, really expensive piano, it's got uh, very sensitive keys. It's disposed to, um, you know, make a, a, a more beautiful sound than an old broken spinet, you know, 100 years old out of tune. So it's, you know, it's a similar um, uh, comparison there. Sure. Um, of course, we, uh, again, enumerate the gifts uh, sevenfold. Um, and we know that from our basic catechism, but maybe it's a good thing to return to basic catechism at times. Um, the, the gift of understanding, the gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom, counsel, piety, fortitude, and fear of the Lord. Um, it could <laughs> go into each one of these, uh, if, if you wish. I mean, some of the, the names of the gifts are pretty clear as to what their purpose is, you know, understanding, giving us a illumination of God, uh, into God, his mysteries, um, knowledge to see uh, s- secondary causes as we uh, describe them, or, you know, the visible things of this world and their relationship to God himself, you know, wisdom which helps our, our charity, uh, gives us a an appreciation or a taste or as the catechism says, a relish uh, for the for the things of God. I always think of a hot dog when I uh, see see wisdom that dates back to uh, third grade. Um, counsel it helps our prudence uh, to make good uh, good choices, uh, direct our action. You know, in the, in the many complexities of of, of our life. Um, piety it helps justice to give to God to give to our neighbor uh, what is owed to them. Uh, fortitude, well, it's, a, it's an easy one. It helps our fortitude, uh, strengthens us um, in ways and at times uh, which can even be heroic. Uh, God doesn't necessarily ask heroism of, of everyone, but um, he does ask heroism at times, and uh, we, we have the, the gift uh, to carry us through. Then, of course, the fear of the Lord. Um, and I think this is one which is oftentimes misunderstood misunderstood as as fear uh you know of god's punishments um uh, you know what is fear of the lord it's it's really seeking god's glory it's it's a very positive thing it's not a it's not a negation um if, if you will or you know a um again a, a fear or a sense of attrition uh, uh or fear of god's punishment uh, but it's really seeking God's glory. It gives a great confidence in God, and that's why it's it's related to the the virtue of hope as well as the virtue of temperance, because it allows us to treasure the real goods of life, the real necessities of life, as opposed to the material necessities. So that's that's a rundown of the uh, seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. Well, that's great. Thank you. Um, in the previous episodes to this one, we were talking about Holy Eucharist. Uh, and Father Robinson was explaining how Holy Eucharist is a, a unique sacrament in that it stays. Um, you know, it, it's it's not just a one-time thing. Um, and I had a question on confirmation. We're talking about the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Mm-hmm. Are these gifts, are they given to us in during confirmation? Uh, and then however much we got at that time is how much we get or... Can we pray to say increase our fortitude and our counsel? Can that grow? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, the first time that we receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost is actually at baptism. So, receiving um, when we say receiving the gifts of the Holy Ghost at confirmation, it's really talking about an increase of these gifts, and okay. uh, and absolutely, we can grow um, in in the gifts themselves. So. We, we define a gift as a habitual disposition to receive the, the action of the Holy Ghost, the action of God. Um, and, and so that habitual disposition is there. The gifts are there. They, they're, they're there continually, even if they're not active, right? Okay. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's there to receive the, the action of God. I, you know, a comparison just comes to mind right now, you know, a baseball player. Um, and for those maybe listening outside the U.S., they may not understand. But, um, you know, a baseball player in the field has a glove on, right? And he's right. not catching balls all the time, but he's ready to catch the ball, right? So it's sort right. of like um, that uh, that disposition always there to receive the action of the Holy Ghost. 
Um, and of course, that disposition can can grow uh, as we as we work upon it, as we become more docile um, to the to the Holy Ghost. Okay, that makes sense. So, so that's an overview of what is received at confirmation. What confirmation is? Uh, can we get into the essentials of the sacrament itself, Father? Yeah, absolutely. And a, a, a clarification that just came to mind that I think I should um, sure. uh, th- throw in there at this point. Um, of course, we talk about in uh, confirmation the the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost, of course, is is one of the three persons. Um, and and it, it's a proper way of speaking. We call this attribution, but the reality is that any time the Holy Trinity acts outside of itself, it's the Trinity acting, right? So, you know, for for the faithful reading about the indwelling of the Trinity in the soul and the indwelling of the Holy Ghost or the coming of the Holy Ghost and the coming of the Trinity, it's really one and the same. Um, It's it's simply an attribution to the third person of the Blessed Trinity um, because he represents uh, the the goodness of God. Or at least we say he is is the the goodness of God. He is the love of God. But again, it, it is an attribution. It is the Trinity... Anytime it acts outside of itself, odd extra, um, it is the uh, Trinity acting as one. The only exception to that is the incarnation, right? It is right. Uh, it's the second person of the Blessed Trinity alone becoming man. Okay. Everything else is the Trinity. All right. So I All right. just had wanted to make that. No, oh, that's that's good. Thank you. Um, but that said, the the sacrament of confirmation was instituted by Christ, just like all the other sacraments. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's real. That's a very good point. Um, maybe I'll start with definition now that we're getting into the, again, as I said, the nuts and bolts of, of confirmation, okay. and then we'll get to that point of institution. Okay. Um, so we define, uh, confirmation as a sacrament, again, instituted by Christ as part of the definition of any sacrament by which there is given to the baptized through the imposition of hands and the anointing of chrism and with certain sacred words, the Holy Ghost, for confessing the faith strongly and publicly by words and actions. So I try to pick a very thorough uh, definition to get all the essential points uh, in in there. Um, So, of course, the subject has to be already baptized. Uh, No one can be confirmed before that baptism. They have, to be, they have to be born first before they grow uh, into spiritual adulthood. And then um, through the imposition of hands and the anointing of chrism, so already we get a look at the what we call the matter of the sacrament there. And with certain sacred words, um, they receive the Holy Ghost. So all those gifts that we talk about, an increase of those gifts uh, for confessing the faith um, strongly and publicly. And that's... An important part of the definition because there is a social aspect to confirmation. Right? Confirmation certainly is for one's spiritual perfection, one's personal benefit, but there's also a benefit um, for the other members of the mystical body as well. Um, so again, through words and actions. Right? And so we, we've defined the sacrament, which we call confirmation. It, I made reference to this earlier, but there are other names for confirmation that have been used throughout history. In fact, the word confirmation doesn't come in um, till probably the age of St. Ambrose. And before that, uh, you'll see different um, descriptions of it, uh, whether it be in scripture or the, or the fathers, you know, for example, the laying on of hands, that's, that's scriptural. Uh, the mystery of anointing, uh, the sacrament of chrism. Uh, you still have in the Eastern churches the word chrismation uh, to talk wow. about uh, confirmation. Uh, it's also been called the perfection. So all these things which, uh, um, you know, suggest to us, they're, they're actually very important uh, as, as we do a historical study on, you know, what, what did an early confirmation look like? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and for sure, both the imposition of hands and the anointing of the subject for confirmation have, have been there. Um, 
it's it, it certainly makes sense um it's sure. interesting that you know christ uh, uh is is called christ uh, because he is anointed uh, he's anointed for various purposes but one of them um and that's what the word christ means the the anointed one um one of those anointings is the anointing of the holy ghost and that's is said in prophecy of him in the book of isaiah of isaiah uh once again so um We've defined confirmation, um, given some of its ancient names. And again, it was uh, a, a sacrament like the others instituted by Christ, uh, uh, which does not mean that Christ himself gave confirmation, right? Okay. Uh, the institution is, is separate then from the giving of uh, the Holy Ghost, uh, which will come later after Christ had um, ascended into heaven. And uh, in fact, scripture is clear on that point. So we're not perfectly clear on as to when the sacrament was instituted, um, but the fact that it happens uh, bef before the ascension is, is clear. Um, in the book of, or in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 7, we can read, Now this he said of the Spirit, which they should receive, who believed in him, for as yet the Spirit was not given, because Christ was not yet glorified. So, mm -hmm. um, the most common opinion is that among theologians is that it was instituted between the um, between Easter and, and the Ascension, and the forty days uh, that our Lord was there. Right? But it's instituted as we, we say by way of a, of a promise, the promise of the Holy right. Ghost um, to to come. He was letting them know ahead of time this is going to be coming by doing that he's instituting it and then it comes true or it takes effect essentially after his uh, ascension exactly right okay um very interesting now of course every sacrament um as has been defined is a a sign uh, a visible sign of the invisible action right of grace and um so we have to talk about that that sign. What is the sign? And this will become this is very important, obviously, for the discussion of the traditional sacraments. But as we um, give some commentary on the the, the new um, ceremony of confirmation, it becomes uh, really important to understand what are the essentials of the sign. And so the sign is made up of the matter. Um, the matter itself is not sufficient to determine the symbolism. And so we have the form, the words, you know, you know just like in, in, in visible um, creation or, you know, in, in, vis in, the, in the, you know, the visible world that we live in, you've got sort of the, the, the rough matter. And from that rough matter, the artisan, uh, um, let's say, gives some form to it that makes it distinguishable. Right. So also mm -hmm. in confirmation. Um, you have the essential matter, but then what's really happening with that material thing? Will the words tell you? Um, now, the matter of confirmation, we distinguish um, in these sacraments between what we call remote matter, so the, sort of the, the material thing in itself, and then approximate matter, so the application of that matter to the person being confirmed. And okay. the remote matter is the sacred chrism. Um, and, and the sacred chrism, one of the, the three holy oils, um, a very special holy oil, um, consecrated by the bishop, is made of olive oil and balsam. The other two holy oils do not have balsam. Uh, chrism alone does, and it's given in those sacraments which confer a character on the soul, those three sacraments that confer a character upon the soul. Um, and, you know, tradition, the, uh, theology, you know, it says that it, it, this is olive oil. It, it is olive oil mixed with the balsam. And there's, there's a wonderful symbolism in this because the olive oil um, has a certain luster or, or sheen, uh, which resembles the brightness of the Christian conscience. Um, olive oil as well is considered to have strength-giving qualities. You know, showing the the strength of the Holy Ghost. Um, 
Also, if you've ever had oil on your hands, you know how hard it is to remove. So it you know, suggests that permanence um, of, of the sacraments. You know, this is a, a sacrament which is, is not repeated. It's there. The, the character is um, etched uh, on, on the soul. And then uh, that, that balsam. Balsam is a, a, a very wonderful, sweet-smelling uh, scent, uh, which, is, which comes from the resin of certain trees. And uh, it's mixed in with that, that oil. Um, scripture uses the, uh, the image of odor, of, of, of a scent to resemble the virtuous life. Um, in this case, the, we say the, the sweet odor of Christ, you know, those, those, uh, those virtues of Christ, the, the Christian virtues, which are meant to be shared in uh, by, by ourselves. Interesting. Um, those watching the traditional uh, ceremony of confirmation, of course, notice, and those that have been confirmed know very well, that after the, the matter is applied, there is a blow on the cheek. <laughs> um, this is not part of the, of, of the matter of the sacrament, uh, but it's, okay. of, of course, that also um, suggests this, the strengthening of the soul, which has happened. Um, now, this... Uh, Prism um, is blessed, or rather consecrated, um, on Holy Thursday. So the night um, in which the, or the day in which the uh, sacraments of the Eucharist, of, of, of the priesthood, have been instituted. Um, you know, also shows that connection with the, the cross. Uh, all the graces of the sacraments flow from the cross. Um, and it's, it's consecrated by the bishop, um, uh, most, most likely because, you know, not all, uh, matter of the sacrament is consecrated, uh, or even blessed, but, um, it, it was, it would seem that it is consecrated, uh, because Christ himself did not use chrism. He did not give, uh, confirmation. And so, uh, this consecration adapts it subsequently as a proper instrument for the sacrament. Um, okay. So unlike baptism where you could in a, in a necessity take, you know, just any plain water and baptize, you can't do that with confirmation. It has to be consecrated as a valid, um, uh, as valid matter. Um, and then again, the, the, the chrism is then applied. It's applied by way of the imposition of hands. Um, and then the anointing with, by the bishop with the thumb on the forehead, uh, nowhere else. And, um, of course, the, the forehead, well, we're, at, we're on Ash Wednesday today, so um, you have the, the, the ashes which are put on the forehead of, of those uh, Catholics that approach, or, or uh, those in general, in fact, it doesn't have to be Catholics, um, that approach the communion rail. It's a um, it's a sign, it's a, and this is a prominent place to wear that sign. And again, the the confirmation of the individual is in part a, a service to the church, right? There, those that are confirmed are wearing the sign of of their leader. Right? They're the soldier wearing the badge going into battle. So it's appropriate that it's that the anointing is is done there. Um, okay. In the ancient church, uh, the anointing went further. They would do the ears, the nostrils, the chest, um, mm -hmm. to you know show all these, if you will, the areas of the soul uh, strengthened by the the grace of confirmation. So that's the that's the matter. Both the remote matter, which is the chrism, and then the proximate matter, which is the uh, laying of hands, the imposition of hands, and the um, signing with the chrism. Now let's get to the form. And so these are the words that are said. Is that correct? Yes. The form are the words which are, are said. And I, I just talk about the traditional uh, form for now, uh, which reads, I sign thee with the sign of the cross, and I confirm thee with the chrism of salvation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And um, this form is perfect uh, for the sacrament. Um, it you know, it tells exactly uh, what is what is happening um, externally and internally. Uh, St. Thomas points out that this uh, solemn formula 
expresses three necessary elements uh, which determine the material symbol. Um, the first one being the principal cause of strength, which is the Trinity. Okay. Um, it also mentions the, the instrumental cause, which is the bishop, right? So the Trinity working through the instruments of the, of the bishop. Uh, the second important element is the effect, so the spiritual strengthening of the soul. And then the third, uh, well, the, the, the sign of the, of the fighter, of the, uh, um, the badge, uh, which is worn by the new um, soldier of Christ, uh, which is the cross, uh, the cross of which Christ won his victory over sin. So the, okay. the form expresses all that. There's no question as to what is being done in, in, in the soul. Uh, there's no question as to uh, what is being symbolized. Very important. And, and I suppose we'll talk about this when we get into the next episode a little bit. But just so we understand, the, since this is not a formula that was given to us directly by Christ himself, as was the case for uh, the Holy Eucharist, for instance, right. um, there could be variation. This was a these this form was in um, was developed by the church, mm -hmm. so it doesn't have to be exactly word for word like some of the other sacraments. Exactly, yeah. And as we'll see in the okay. in the new um, rites of confirmation, as well as the Eastern rites, which have been acknowledged as valid, um, the form is different. Different. Okay. All right. Um, so that's the that's the form of confirmation. Um, could we talk a little bit more about the effects, Father? I guess starting with the character. This is one of those sacraments that has uh, an indelible mark on the soul, like we mentioned earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the character of confirmation, uh, it's, it's a unique character. And, of course, when we try to imagine um, something which is by its nature purely spiritual, we... We, we imagine it in material terms. What is this character of, of, of confirmation? Is it, you know, like I was saying earlier, is it simply a, a baseball glove, so to speak, you know, that receives right. the, um, the, the effects of, of the Holy Ghost? Um, is the character more of a weapon, you know, where we, we go on the attack, if you will, uh, for the sake of God? Because we, we, we talk about the... Um, confirmed as a soldier of Christ, um, and and the the reality is is that it's it's a it's a bit of both. Um, um, theology will talk about the uh, the character of baptism be more of a passive character, you know, receiving the effect of, of, of God, or the, or, yeah. um, and and actually talk about ordination being more of an active character. Um, confirmation combines both. It uh, is this capacity to receive the inspirations of the Holy Ghost, and then, uh, furthermore, to be be active, to go on the attack, if you will, um, you know, for for the sake of God, and you know, it's it's a real signing, spiritual signing, a real spiritual mark on the soul, which is indelible and never um, goes away. It it serves the confirmed um, when is when is necessary, as we said earlier, um, the. The gifts are not always going to be active um, all the time, but the ability to um, be active when necessary is is there all the time. Uh, so it is something which which is which is permanent, and um, you know can help to, if you will, stir up the the, the strength of God in the soul um, as is necessary. I think of um, a quote in the let's see the. Um, uh, the epistle to Timothy, one of the epistles to Timothy, where St. Paul tells Timothy, you know, stir up the, the basically stir up the grace of the ordination uh, within you. Mm. And uh, in, we can do the same thing uh, with, with confirmation to stir up that, that grace as, as necessary. Um, so the character is, is one of the, uh, well, a very important effect of, of confirmation. And as I mentioned earlier, um, there's also a, a social effect as well. Uh, confirmation is meant to prepare us for the apostolate, you know. And and, and that word apostolate, um, you know, harkens back to to the apostles, the, the work of the apostles. The apostles were sent out 
uh, to preach the gospel, um, to do a, a heroic things uh, for the for the sake of Christ. Um, and the apostolate, generally speaking, is is continuing that that work of of the of the apostles. And um, and confirmation is is meant to um, prepare them for that. Um, I'm going to come back to this in, in the second episode as well. Okay. All right. Um, then the next part, every sacrament has to have a minister. So in confirmation, we've talked about the bishop. So ordinarily, it's the bishop, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Ordinarily, it is the bishop. Um, the bishop has been giving that that plenitude of, of of priestly power, and it makes sense that he be the one who is consecrating. Is because he's sort of like the the commander in chief, you know, in his area, in his diocese. He's the one that decides. Okay, this person is fit uh, for for battle. This, you know, to to be in the, the ranks of the of the spiritual army, um, and admits him and marks him uh, for that that purpose. Um, however, um, extraordinarily, uh, the priest can confirm. Um, now, now, as as an aside, in the Eastern Church, uh, it is the practice, unlike in the Western Church, to confirm right after baptism. So, you know, mm-hmm. as an infant, uh, to to confirm as as a uh, as an infant, uh, which of course the bishop is not <laughs> confirming all those children. He, he wouldn't have time uh, to to do that. And so for many centuries, the Eastern Church priests have had that um, sort of tacit privilege to, to, to confirm. Um, so that's, okay. it's not the same in the Western Church, right? I, I don't have the ability to confirm. I don't have the faculty uh, to confirm right after baptism, um, but to, you know, obviously follow the, the rules governing um, uh, the, the the pastoral work in the Western Church to wait till they're at a certain age to prepare them for the coming of the bishop. Um, okay. Now there are extraordinary circumstances, of course, and uh, canon law. Um, in the case of the society, our own regulations, um, and it's the spirit of the church, um, give us the uh, delegate to us the power to confirm someone who is in danger of death. Um. So that, that makes sense. Many things can be done by the sure. priest in the time of danger of death that ordinarily would not be. Right. Um, and then who can be confirmed, Father? Any, anyone? Anyone baptized? Anyone not baptized? Yeah, so um, only those that are baptized. Um, okay. And all those who are baptized um, and not been confirmed yet can be, ad- be admitted to the, the sacrament. Uh, it is interesting, unlike baptism, uh, which is necessary for salvation by necessity of means, we say, uh, confirmation is not necessary for salvation um, with a necessity of means. Now, it would be very difficult, of course, uh, to be a good Catholic, especially in this world with all its traps, you know, sensuality and pride. In the concupiscence of the eyes um, to to be a good Catholic without confirmation, but it doesn't have that same uh, level of necessity. Ne- nonetheless, the you know, the Church you know, wants all its children uh, to be baptized uh, for uh, their great benefits to to handle the challenges that are that lie ahead for them. Um, okay, and then of course there there is ecclesiastical law which regulates when. Uh, that baptized person can approach uh, the the bishop for confirmation, and again in the, in, the, in what we call the Latin Church. Um, so those are, which are governed by the the law uh, of of Rome. Um, it is the practice uh, to wait until the use of reason. Um, and, and and that being said, of course, Rome does approve the the Eastern uh, uses as well. Um, okay. but, uh, again, it's, it's, it's a practice to wait till the child has the use of reason. Again, if, if the child is in danger of death, the priest as, uh, can, can confirm, you know, even an infant, um, it's not because the infant needs to use confirmation, um, to 
you know, profess the faith and defend the faith, uh, obviously. But in case of death, it, it can add to the glory, their eternal glory in heaven. Uh, right, you have sure. that mark on their soul. And um, okay. it's interesting to look into why um, the Latin Church postponed confirmation um, till a time when uh, the child is aware. Um, because it wasn't always that way. There was a time uh, when you know it was done, like in the East, uh, after after baptism. But then it became universal that uh, it was the the age of reason. Um, and my my own experience, as well as a pastor, I'm sure you know, everyone else too, you know, sees the benefit of this um, waiting. Uh, and it's been a, a bit of a debate <laughs> that comes up from time to time. You know, sh how should we wait? How long should we wait? Um, you know, certainly there are those those additional moral challenges that come to a young person in their adolescence. So it makes sense that they receive confirmation in time uh, for for that new change in life and then those new challenges which come up. But again, it comes back to to disposition, right? You're, you're trying to make the person. Uh, the, the young Christian as disposed uh, for the operation of the Holy Ghost um, as much as you possibly can. So um, through a, a preparation of mind, um, a, a preparation of, of knowledge, um, and a, um, a, a uh, let's say the, the moral preparation, right? So um, they get, they get trying to instill uh, the, 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 the virtues uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the child as well. Um, even though a, a sacrament gives grace, what we call ex opere operato, um, that is to say by the very action which is done, you know, as long as the subject being confirmed does not have an obstacle there, the, 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 the sacrament will work. It will, it will give um, its, its grace, its effect. And by the way, confirmation is a sacrament of living, which means you have to be in the state of grace to receive it. Um, it's validated, okay. but the effect, you know, the grace does not come into the soul. Um, but, um, yeah, so even though the, the sacrament works ex opere operato by the fact that it's just done, there is a certain, um, what we call ex opere operantis element, um, you know, whereby through one's personal work, the sacrament's more effective, if you will, again, mm -hmm. through uh, creating the, the good dispositions. Does that make sense? I, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically if, if someone is, has understood what the sacrament is, understands the gifts of the Holy ghost, goes through the catechism of all of that mm -hmm. and is able, it's able to re, uh, the person is able to receive the sacrament more, not more fully, but is able to benefit more from the sacrament. Right. Exactly. Uh, you know, the, a, okay. a, a classic illustration of that is the, the vessel, um, you know, containing the water, right? So you, you can have a vessel of small proportions, which can be filled up, right? But if um, a, a vessel, uh, which is of greater proportions, will have more water in it, right? So that um, work of disposing the soul for confirmation is trying to expand that vessel so it can contain more water, so to speak. Sure, that makes sense. Okay. Um, in terms of... So uh, confirmation is another sacrament like baptism where there needs to be a third person involved. Um, so in confirmation, we call that a sponsor instead of a godparent. What is the, what is the reason for, for needing a sponsor for confirmation father? Yeah, the, the sponsor, um, I guess you could, you, you could use the, uh, example of, I don't know, maybe, maybe medieval knighthood, right? Uh, one grew through, a squire into a knight. So right? there's that that mentorship which happens, uh, um, that uh, responsibility uh, for another that uh, that that is that is taken on. Um, I remember some of the year, uh, the last years I was in the seminary um, when new applicants came. You know, first years came to the seminary. Uh, some of the older seminarians would act as guardian angels. You know, they would show them around the seminary sure. to, uh, you know, tell them what the, the rules were, or where things were, you know, just kind of watch over their back, if you will, uh, for the for the beginning days. 
um, in a certain sense, the the sponsor of confirmation is is like that, you know, to take care of, of, the, of the newly confirmed, uh, take on responsibility for their furthering Christian um, ed- education. Yeah. So that's the long okay. and short of that. And of course, they uh, the, the sponsor themselves have to be confirmed. It wouldn't make sense right. um, otherwise. Right. Right? Now, the the sponsor should be of of, of suitable age as well. Um, you know, at least thirteen years old. Uh, I bring that up because sometimes, of course, siblings want uh, other siblings to be their uh, confirmation sponsor. So, uh, what's the cutoff age? We have to make some some cutoff age. Sure. Okay. So the the sponsor has to be Catholic, has to be confirmed, has to be of suitable age. Um, is it customary or necessary for the sponsor to be of the same gender as the one being confirmed? Um, it is customary. The, the church wants it. I mean, unless for some reason it's it's very difficult. Otherwise, exceptions can be made. But the church wants the uh, uh, the, those of the same gender to be the sponsor. Okay. And then it also, um, it can't be the same as a godparent. Is that right? So if, if I have a godparent, I cannot use the same godparent. Yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly right. They want it to be, the church wants it to be someone separate from the, uh, from the godparent. Um, again, unless, uh, no one else can be found in, uh, you know, an exception could be made in that circumstance. Um, okay. It can happen that uh, you have those that come into the church and they only know so many people. <laughs> um, none sure. of the relatives are, are Catholic. You know, no one in the parish is really well known to them. They're a catechumen, um, you know, maybe in this circumstance. But. Okay. And then during confirmation, the person being confirmed, the confirmand, um, takes on a name. Yes. Um, and this is another name on top of what they're given at baptism. Um, yeah. Is, is this like to have the intercession of another patron saint or? exactly yeah um it is it is customary throughout christendom to take on patrons at certain significant moments of um of a, a person's spiritual growth and in the sacramental life especially um it's recommended it's not necessary of course but uh, again in in the path to ordination that a uh, an ordinance maybe for their various minor and major orders i take on a patron uh to help along hmm. but so also in, in confirmation um you uh take a patron to help you uh, to be an intercessor in heaven for the responsibilities of confirmation okay um and then i have one last question unless you have uh some more to chat about um can there be, we saw that there could be baptism of desire. Yes. Does something like that exist for confirmation as well? Yes. That's, that's, that's a great point. Um, so you have to demonstrate this, um, in, in the early church martyrs who were, uh, you know, not even baptized. <laughs> in fact, uh, there were, there was a baptism of desire, you know, certainly, uh, in, in the, in, the, in that stage of wanting to, uh, be incorporated in Christ, but but then certainly not confirmed either. And yet we see the effects of confirmation in their martyrdom. This is heroic fortitude. Um, so we we can we can certainly answer that as well. Yes, um, we don't speak of a, a, a confirmation of desire, but that is effectively what it is. God provides the grace which is necessary for salvation, even in an extra sacramental way. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, well, Father, thank you so much for taking the time to go through this with us. Thank uh, you. Next week, we're going to be looking at the the new form as well. Yes, absolutely. And and, and again, okay. uh, talk a little bit more about the traditional form, um, the traditional ceremony, to um, uh, give a good compare and contrast explanation. Very good, Father. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Take care. All right.